Okay, so this week, um, so good morning, everybody. Um, I hope that you have lunch and that you are ready for this hour and a half in which I hope you are not sleeping or will not sleep enough. But um, this week we will start speaking about multimodal interaction. In a way, we started to speak about multimodal interaction last time uh, when we spoke about uh, designing for diversity because we increased the, the amount of information that we can consider and that we can deliver not only via a visual component, so not only via a, a graphical user interface, and, and this is actually taken from the, the previous set of slides and it's just a recap, just to remember that uh, typically the interaction that we design with technology depends heavily from what we can understand or remember, so cognitive factors, but also from more physical, physiological factors like what we can see, hear, say, and touch. And we cannot assume that all the senses and abilities are fully enabled every single time because this means ignoring s several people. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea is that we would, would like our design to reflect this diversity. On the other side, uh, we can, we should probably also leverage on some of these senses at a time. So we are typically focused on vision, on the graphical user interface, on what we see. But again, assuming that vision is fully enabled all the time is tricky as well. Because maybe I can see, but I cannot see well. Or maybe I can have some reinforcement on the action that appears in a graphical user interface. And this reinforcement, maybe it's not visual, is using another sense. Mm? So it's complementary, mm? not in opposition, not in, a, in substitution, but it's complementary to another sense. So keep in mind what we said, mm? clearly we don't want to have an application that uses all the senses together, mm? probably too much. Vision, smell, sound, touch, all together. Um, very, very complex so that we have a lot to understand, to understand. So probably not that way. But on the other side, we probably don't want the other extreme. We don't want an application that is purely visual. Mm? So that if you are seated here, comfortably, comfortable, uh, you can see and without any problem, but if you are using the application in, on the run, under the rain, or under a very um, strong sun, in a sunny day, then you, you cannot, you don't want to be uh, only have the visual components enabled, fully enabled. Also, you can be distracted because you are doing other activities. So there are hmm, trade-off in doing things, balancing between uh, an ideal, hypothetical, non-existent application that uses all the senses together I think that you cannot imagine one application that uses one interactive system that uses all the senses together right now. Um, and vice versa, we don't want probably an application that uses only vision. And also in our experience, if you think about the, the laptop that you have in front of you or the tablets that you have in front of you or the smartphones, we already, the application that you use are not poorly visual right? They have other components, typically sound. Mm -hmm. Example? Notifications, but something more subtle, even than notification that is specific. When you type on the keyboard on your smartphone, does a, it make a sound to give you a feedback, but it's an additional feedback because you, because you already see if you want. One feedback is what I pressed with my uh, finger. The other feedback is what I see on the screen, and the third feedback is what I heard. Mm -hmm. And another sub example, 
on your Windows slash Linux slash Mac OS operating system. It's typically in the desktop, on the desktop. An action that you can do and that typically does a sound to confirm that the action is complete. The trash bin. When you empty the trash bin. When you shut down the system. Yeah, some systems, yeah. Some system does some noise, others not. But yeah, the, the trash bin. I was thinking about the trash bin. When you empty the trash bin, there is an animation, the trash that becomes empty, and there is a sound. Hmm? We will see we, that for, for the sound, there is quite a lot of uh, background. We've got a lot of studies around sounds. Um, and we will see how these sounds, like the trash bin or the keyboards, can be classified. They have a specific name, a specific category in which they belong. They were invented at a certain point in time, and they still exist since the 80 or the 70 in those categories. But this is just sound that is it's good and vision. Uh, but the question that we can also ask ourselves is, given that we have all these capabilities, abilities, we can sense different things, not just vision, not just hearing. Can we design an application or a system that leverage on multiple sense and senses and abilities at the same time? Something a little bit more than let's add a sound to a specific event. That is good, clearly, because it gives you more uh, way to see, to, to perceive that that action is complete. Not only visual, you cannot look, if you empty the trash, the trash bin on your desktop, you can also close your eyes, but you know if the operation is completed by the sound, if you listen, if you have audio, the sound on, clearly. Hmm? And vice versa, if you cannot uh, listen because it's a noise environment, you can see that the trash is now empty because it, the animation show you an empty trash at that moment. Hmm? But we can design an application that leverage more on this thing hmm, at the same time, and typically yes, but we should be careful. And maybe we can provide different input and output mechanism in different contexts from different people. Hmm? Um, we, we have seen an example of this briefly last time when I told you there is a video about uh, an application for a smart home used by Night Tracker. And that application was also um, touch-based, and it emits sounds, it emits voice, actually speech, uh, and it was eye tracking, so you can actually use the, your eyes to input information on the screen. And there is also the vision, because you also have the graphic user application. So what we are going to speak today and next time is this multimodality. So enabling an application to have multiple, to leverage multiple senses and multiple abilities to do their job, to complete their task. Putting together in alternative or uh, in a more complementary way, different abilities that we have, like speaking and seeing, like hearing and doing something else. And we can do this, again, in more um, complementary way by adding redundancy. Hmm? The, the trash bin, the sound of the trash bin emptied, is a redundant because it's something that you already have in vision and vice versa. The vision, the animation, is a redundant with respect to the sound. Hmm? But we can also have adding this kind of multimodality for compatibility with assistive technology. So I cannot see but I can use a software for, that reads the screen for me in a vocal way. So if my application is able to work with this piece of technology, then I enable also this kind of interaction with, with, with my very same visual application that I have. Do you think other reasons or other ways in which you can enlarge this, or other example in which we can enlarge this Accept the redundancy and compatibility with other kind of technologies. Do 
virtual assistants, conversational assistants, that like, like Siri and, and Google Home and you know, OK Google and um, uh, Alexa. Yeah. Um, are they multimodal? Which smartphone, uh, so, sorry, yeah, he, he was saying that there are some Alexas with, some uh, Amazon Echo with uh, speakers and screen, and, but don't you have those on your smartphone? And on your smartphone they are purely vocal or not? No, you have a screen and you sh see the results and actually some actions are only for um, you can do only some action by tapping on things. You cannot speak on, on your smartphone. And you can also type some, sometimes, not, not speak. So again, this could be a good example of, of multimodality. It's something that mm, starts with the idea of speaking, but that enables you also to write. And some action is totally visual. And the answer is both visual and audio. Mm? Because you see the results, but also you you listen for, for it. Others? Otherwise, I... Vibrations. Yeah, there's another, it's not so sound, it's not uh, vision, but it's another sense that we have, mm, for sure. Noticing that it's vibrate. Maybe it's not the main way in which we convey information, but it, it could be. So putting together this thing in a intelligent, let's say, way, in a balanced way, could really help the user of our application to use the application better. And not only to use the application better, but also enable other people, inclusive design, to use our application. Last time we spoke about the Xbox and the controller, and some of you said we can do this controller that is used by feet for instance. This is another way of multimodal, in a way, because it's, it, it's still touch, in a way. Not touch with hands, but touch with other uh, part of the body. But it, it's still a way that increments hmm, the modality in which you can interact in specific context about, with an interactive system. Hmm. So in addition to conversational assistant, for instance, all the accessibility features of either desktop-based uh, so, uh, computer or smartphones slash tablets, hey, here we have just an example of a uh, uh, Mac OS and Android, hmm? they have built in some accessibility features. Hmm? Some of them, uh, so for instance, reading the content of the screen, it's built in in your smartphone, in every smartphone now. Hmm? So if you have difficulties in reading, for any reason, temporary or not, you can enable the screen reading for all your application, for all the, the operat at the level of the operative system. Mm -hmm. And this clearly works well if the application supports that in a proper way and doesn't work well if the application or the website or whatever it is doesn't enable mm, the transcription of, for instance, visual elements like images this thing can read what is on screen, but if it's on screen there is a picture, the thing that I can say is it's a picture, but not describe the content of the picture. It's up to the developer and the designer think that if the picture is poorly aesthetic, maybe it's fine. Maybe it doesn't even read, need to be written, to be read by uh, one, a software like this. But if the picture is a graph, is a picture of an architecture, is a picture of something that brings meaning, then should have something attached to the picture or a description behind the picture, below the picture, that describe the important information also for people that cannot see the picture. So this has both an impact as for we as designer, we as developers, and, and we also as a user that can use this uh, software, these technologies to, to ease our life. And then nowadays there are other, so for instance here, uh, you have spoken content, you have descriptions, 
uh, but you also have uh, voiceover, hmm? so screen reading. You have zoom, increasing the content of an entire screen or a portion of the screen. Hmm? Because maybe you don't read, it's too small and you can increase. So these were uh, actually fought for accessibility reason, but even uh, maybe an elderly person that is not yet read, able to read fonts very, very small uh, on the screen can use the zoom to increase mm, the, the size of the, of, the, of the font and read better. Mm. And clearly, also the application should be designed to, to take advantage, to don't mess things up if you zoom, too mu zoom, zoom in too much. Etc. Here they're split in overview, vision, earring, etc. So one for each, which senses. So again, multimodal interaction as a definition, let's say a more formal definition, is to use more than one sensory channel or mode of interaction. Mm -hmm. And we have these. So which, which is the difference between sensory channel and mode of interaction? It's written here, with, by example, but it's written here. Yeah, basically, the sensory channels are something that we perceive, our sensors, let's say. So vision, smell, hearing, Touch, touch meaning I, 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 I see that you are, I have something, something on my hand because my, my, I see that, I understand that, I perceive that. And taste, something tastes good, tastes salty, tastes sweet, it's sensory. And the mode of interaction is what we can do. We can, with the vision, we can gaze at things, we can look at things. So not we perceive, but we are intentional in looking at a specific point for a specific time, maybe for doing some specific actions. Uh, voice, it's, we can speak with this as conversational assistant that we said before. So it becomes a way of interacting of things, gestures. Not only 3D gestures, in-air gestures, like Kinex or something like that, but also gestures like the swipe on a smartphone. Uh, well, hearing smell doesn't have a mode of interaction up to now. It's difficult to interact with our smell because we perceive smell. We don't, yeah, we also maybe emit smell, but it's not the same thing of, of the noise. And hearing the same. The complementary hearing is the voice. So we, we can say that they have five sensory channels and three mode of interaction. And we, up to now, but also typically, we use a lot vision. But we use a lot of vision in our daily life. It's the main uh, input for us, for a human being, for information, what we see much more than what we he hear, or what we taste, or what we touch. So vision is, in general, responsible for 90% or something like that of the information that we perceive from the world. And this clearly is reflecting on our system, on the system that humans design, that since we are so used to, to use vision to get information, our system uses visions primarily to provide information because it's what we are used to and what we do well, get information from the visual world. Hmm? And we have sa said that there is a little bit of hearing in the graphic user interface, there is a little bit of voice with this conversational assistant, there is a little bit of gestures if you think about um, swiping, uh, etc. There is not a lot, there is not a lot or at all of touch. Hmm? Again, what I perceive on my body. Uh, well, there is a little bit of hearing. There is no smell, I would say, 
right now, no interface that produces smell to indicate that this something is going well or not, and similarly not taste. Mm. So multimodal, again, definition quite general, because it depends from specific context, clearly, is again to use more than one of these, either sensory or mode of interaction together. Mm. So our normal, let's say, operating system already are a bit multimodal because they enable us to use vision, but they, they on Windows you can have also the touch screen, mm. so they also enable gestures and um, hearing because of sounds. Mm. Mostly, vo mostly vision, but a little bit of the others. But we can probably do better, or we should do better mm. than not just the standard. That is good because it already enables different way of giving feedbacks. Mm. But we can also do more than this if needed, if, if you want. Maybe for including, re adding redundancy or for including more people in our, in using, allowing more, allowing more people to use our application, our system. Mm. Uh, okay, basically this is what we already said. Uh, most interactive systems are visual, and we, we know. They are often WIMP-based. Do you remind what is WIMP? That one. Stand for? I think that it was mentioned, at least, at the beginning of the course. One of the first lecture, Professor Corno. Nobody. Any guess? WIMP user interface are the one that we are typically using on our computers. Windows, W for Windows. One, right. Three are missing. <laughs> No, not interactive. Icons. M. No, not mouse. File, edit, view, R. Menus. And P. P. Pointer. Graphical user interface that uses a window-based approach with icons and menus and pointers are WIMP user interface that are 90% or 100% of the computer user interface. Mm -hmm. Smartphones are clearly not WIMP. Maybe not clearly, but for sure they don't have pointers. Mm -hmm. Are sort of WIMP. Not totally different from WIMP, but because they still have window, one at a time in most cases. They still have icons, and they still have menus. They don't have pointers with the mouse, but you point with your finger. So in a way, it's a bit of evolution. Is you can say, we can say among us, WIMP 2.0, like the next generation of WIMP, but it's is clearly not far, far enough, hmm? far away from WIMP user interface. It's something very, very cl still close to WIMP. Hmm? And given that WIMP windows, icon, menus are all visual element, it's clear that our interface are predominantly visual because icons are visual, menus again, and windows too. Pointers, okay, maybe not, not totally, but it pertain to the visual world. Hmm? So they are being based, all the interface, and they make use of simple sound, like the one that we mentioned before, but the t tendency, also probably in your user interface and the prototype that you build, is put information on the screen, show information, hmm? more than, I don't know, uh, here, have the user hear some information. 
or also hear some information. Uh, and this creates clearly a problem, maybe not for simple system, but for complex system, when you have a lot of information to, to deliver, uh, the visual channel may be overloaded. You're seeing too much. You don't know what to focus on because you have 11 things to focus on in front of you and which are the important things. So a good user interface could help in this, but if there are too much things that move around, at a certain point, it becomes complex. And this may lead to frustration or error in use or the needs of training. So using multiple modes actually increase the bandwidth of interaction. Because it enables us not to focus on the visual part, but also to receive others' information with the other senses and maybe input some information with other senses. So allow us to stay a little bit away from vision and to focus also on other activities. It can be making me more engaged with also the interface. So we should always, in any case, remember that multimodal interaction is not just about enhancing the richness of interaction. Like, oh yes, let's add also audio or voice or touch or smell because it's good or it's, it's innovative or for any reason, hmm? just for the sake of adding this, uh, but also especially for redundancy. Hmm? So redundancy enabling other people to, other hmm, abilities to use our uh, system is also one of the reasons for which you build multimodal interaction. So again, providing the same information, or maybe slightly different information, with different means, with different uh, mode of interaction, with different, through different sensory channels. Mm -hmm. And so we, here we have just two examples. Actually, both were mentioned before of multimodal interaction that we already use. These are clearly strongly multimodal interaction. There is the Google Home or the Amazon Echo or whatever you want, that the hardware device that has vision, because you, you see the screen, you see what is written. Hmm? There is a weather forecast, there is a button for playing or relaxing music, and whatever. Uh, a lamp that is on, and probably you can also turn off, and a button for set alarms. Hmm? So there is vision, there is gestures. You can tap on things. You can scroll, you can swipe on the screen. And there is earring, because that thing is a conversion assistant, so mainly vocal, so you, it, it speaks to you when you speak to it. So there is also speech. So if we go back to that picture with the senses, we have vision, eyes, gestures, around touch, hearing, and speech, voice. And this is multimodal, and they work in a balanced way together. And this is another example, not an hardware device, this is Siri on, on Mac OS a few years ago, actually. But again, you have vision, you have gesture, you have hearing, and you have speech. Well, gesture. Clicking with the mouse more than gesture. But still, you, you need to use your hand to do something. You need to move your hand, you need to move the mouse pointer to, I don't know, click here or click here. And you see the results, what time is it? And you listen to the results because it speaks it's five or one. And you also, you also can speak, say, in the wake word for Siri that I'm not going to, to say now. And uh, what time is it to trigger the conversational assistant and to generate the the request. Mm? Again, request that you both see on screen and listen. So, small exercise for you. And here there is no solution for this. And probably it's not even, no, not probably, it's not even in the slides that you have uh, on the web. 
uh, but it's just an empty, the, the next one you have. So it's just an empty slide. Um, because after this, we are going in deep analyzing one sensory channel slash mode of interaction at a time, excluding vision, because we already have done basically all the course on vision. So we just move vision around. Um, and we focus on the other senses, what we can do. But we are going to take it individually. Mm? So for, for what we have said up to now, let's try to summarize. Advantages and disadvantages of multimodal interface. Imagine a user interface that maybe doesn't exist. Mm? Imagine that you can technically do whatever you want to do. And so you are adding multimodality to this interface that is always used for fulfilling a given scope, a given task for the user. Which are, and we have said, uh, we have said some advantages and partially some disadvantages of multimodal interaction interfaces. But let's try to, as an exercise, let's try to add maybe three advantages and three disadvantages something like that as a summary of what we said before and also for, for thinking a little bit more about in general about multimodal interface. So why advantages and why not disadvantages also considering edge case, like what happens if I exaggerate, if I add too many input modality or sensory channels? That could be probably an, something that goes in the disadvantages, right? So let, let's think three minutes, something like that, and then you can also speak if you want. And then let's try to add, put here some something. Mm hmm Yes, it's okay to mention something that we can, we already said. So it, it works also as both as a summary and uh, as maybe new ideas that you, you have. So you already have stopped to think and you want to speak, right? Do you have something in mind? No, these, these two things are right. Uh, we can, I can, I can brought that, but. Yeah, no, I'm going to repeat them. But just to know if you want a few more minutes or, or not. Or silence, that I don't know what means, if yes or not. Maybe one minute. Mm. Okay. Keep in mind what you, you have said and for one minute.
Okay, so I'm going to write what he said, so more or less. Enabling more people to use, successfully, successfully use our application, right? Give the benefits of making the system. Yes, I think that more or less also can the system available in different situations. And environments. Uh, yes, here we can say enabling more people, uh, mm, improving the application for all, for me, as a consequence, maybe. Hopefully, we'll take an appointment. Mm. In theory, yes. In theory, it should be more, well, the, the problem with the word natural is more, okay, it, this is pure philosophy. The problem with the, the word natural is the same as the, prob uh, the word normal. Uh, what is natural for people that, was born blind is not natural to see. Uh, for us, yes, it is. For us here in this room, yes, it is. Um, so yes, it could be using multimodal interaction, using other way of interacting that is not keyboard, mouse, touch screen, etc. could be more easier, like voice. Could be in theory more easier and quick, and etc. Like you, you said, probably it's, it's faster to say, add this to my to-do list or make an appointment for tomorrow at seven to this person, if it works. So yes, in theory it is, in practice uh, we are not still there, but um, yeah, that is true, it's true. But this is not something that we can probably generalize too much because this for vision, if we think to other, yeah. Yeah, also. Um, others, maybe one other advantage, and then we move to disadvantages, otherwise. Yes, we are redundancy. So redundancy and, re and personalization and adaptation, what is better? Why redundancy? Oh, okay. uh, but you know, adaptation is not so different from these. And partially also as a result as this. But yes, they are connected, clearly. All these three things are connected. Any other unconnected advantage? Repeat. Mm. Yes, uh, still a bit connected to redundancy, but we can list it, emphasizing, no. Um, um, 
critical feedback, let's say. Yes, uh, it could go together with the emphasizing critical feedback, not for the feedback, but for um, fixing in memory. I don't know if it's, in Italian we would say fixing, but in memory specific critical, also in this way, actions, maybe. Well, there is too much critical in this sentence, but um, it's fine. Other column. Yeah, let's try to. So, what you said is if I create a new sound that nobody as listened before, uh, they don't recognize it. And maybe they don't perceive, right, as, as, as conveying the information that they want to convey with the sound. If we can try to generalize, I don't know how, but try to generalize it a bit. So instead of speaking of sound, something more general li like this. Because this is a disadvantage of sound, specifically that has nothing to do with vision or the interface per se. It's more, yeah, it's, it's a disadvantage for sound, adding sounds to a user interface. So why it's maybe good to use existing sounds instead of reinventing one. But it's very, very specific, you know, in a way. It's not wrong, but it's specific. Something more general. many senses, redundancy, redundant, I'm not able to write, redundant, um, can bring to overload. Uh, you, you mentioned some, someone, yeah, not only, but yeah, for sure that is, um, So this could be also true in general. Um, and, uh, or in specific context. Maybe I'm, I don't know, uh, I, I am at home, I have three children that cry all from hours, I've slept one hour uh, today and when I, open my computer, whatever, I have this fancy multimodal interface that starts emitting sound, Im images, asking me to speak all together, and say, no. Now I need something more calm, more quiet, than not this thing that try to, to, to have too much redundancy and to present too much information at a time in different modalities, because I, I have an age and I have terrible humor, um, and so we, I, so also specific context. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually video games are, are a good example of multimodality. Because they typically want to create an immersive environment, even if not in virtual reality, but also in the, in the real reality. Uh, they want to, to create this immersive environment so that you are more engaged with the game and you can play more um, and be more in the story that is narrated, yeah. Okay, but go. Yeah, 
If you are doing a Okay, so for multitasking application, it could be confusing if you have uh, multiple things that run together at a certain time, maybe a window behind another window within the same application, you say. Yeah. Uh, an example of a multitasking application like that? But you don't download in Excel. And that's the tricky part. So yeah, it, it could be true. If you have a really multimodal application that enable, enable, that has different components that run in parallel, like different missions in a video game, I, I don't know. Uh, so that one thing is running in the ground and you are doing some other things and then you don't know where the sound come, on, come, come from. Uh, this happens with, with two different applications right now. Maybe you have a browser that's downloading and then you have music somewhere else and then you have Excel in front and then you have, I don't know what, uh, in another screen or another window. And so all this together, you hear a sound, say, okay, where? Excel, it was the browser, it was the music application, it was the other application. So yeah, that could be, um, so disadvantages could be uh, difficulty to understand where, from where, um, let's say feedback mm, slash output came from, or I say, where my attention is needed in a multitasking app. I would say, since we are not accustomed, uh, uh, the learning curve could be stiff, right? And? Yeah, because the key, the key point in designing a good multimodal is a redundancy, not splitting, not reserving information on only on one, on one side, critical information especially. Yeah, but it's, it could be true. Uh, yeah. I will not write that as a disadvantage. No. <laughs> car and then the car. But you know, we we have already some kind of multimodal inter interface. We said before, video games are a good example, actually, of, of multimodal in their specific context, clearly. But they are already probably a good example of multimodal in interface. Not extreme multimodal interface, clearly, but you, you have to, you know, to, to shoot and then you, to see uh, how much life you have and then 
you, you maybe some, say, some sound from the enemies in the back or behind, and then there is a sound that the message coming from another person in, on, on your team, on the game. So it could already be. So yeah, probably an extreme multimodal interface, like if you want to add smell to uh, an interface, that probably, yes, could, be, could slow down the development process. But if we reason about reasonable <laughs> multimodal interface, not so much. It, it, te it takes a more effort than just a visual interface. That's for sure, because you have to put, so we can, we can see that it's, it's linked. Yeah, um, more effort, it's, it's a consequence, is needed to, to develop, also to design. with respect to a graphical user interface. Hmm? Clearly, because you have to say, okay, now the sound, where does it go? And what it goes to the audio, what is visual, what is both, which information, so clearly it's more effort. Um, either you raise your voice or Actually, our device, so what's saying was retrocompatibility of existing stuff, application, whatever, because the device could not support maybe everything. But actually, in the, the smartphone, let's take that as an example, has way more sensors that our application use. Any medium application use, much more capabilities that, than that. So, more or less. Uh, last one, go. You should, yeah, if you want to speak with a, let's say, conversational agent and you don't have voice in that, that day because it, you get a cold, um, you, you cannot use it if it's unimodal because just voice, but if you enable uh, writing, so another channel, if you enable writing, you can use that by writing, by typing, and vice versa. If you cannot type because you broke your, your arm, you can speak. But also that is, again, redundancy, because you don't use voice, but type. You cannot type, but voice. So yeah, that, that is one of the core idea of multimodal interface for, for inputting data, for example. Yes. There could be, but also with normal, not multimodal application, that could be. So if I just have a, a camera-based application, pretty visual, with also camera, and no speech, no audio, no, no other things, just cameras recording people in a room and displaying on a screen, already have privacy issues. It's not something particular for multimodal uh, application. It's something that is in the context that you use any kind of application. And, yes, it's true. And this is a disadvantage, why? Okay, uh, I w but it's again, it's very specific to the conversation. So I think that is more, we can say that is related to the learning curve. Because I cannot use, I, I cannot be sarcastic with a conversational assistant because it doesn't understand sarcasm. Um, but it's, it's something that I have to learn, hmm? so that I have in front of me a piece of hardware and not a person. And so it doesn't behave like a person. 
So I would, I would put it in the learning curve mm, for, for that. Mm. Okay, end of, the, of this game. Then I can, I can update the slides on, on, online with, with this one more, these slides uh, in addition. So let's, let's write just Just remember, next year. So, in depth, um, the idea is to, so if we want to build a multimodal application, we need to understand what we can do. What we can do as human beings, and what we can do from a technological perspective. Uh, so we are going to analyze some of these, uh, some with a more, um, with some examples that are something that you can go buy and use in that way. So very, very, uh, something that you can do tomorrow if you want. Other things, like for smell, that you cannot, cannot yet. Mm, that is more related to research. Mm. There is some research about multisensory interaction that also considers smell and taste for interaction, but clearly, is not yet ready for being put on a normal user application. But they, they did some experiment. So for instance, smell in cars to, to advertise, to, to, to warn the, the driver that something happened. So instead of adding another screen or adding another sound where maybe you, you have maybe audio, your music, they use smell. And it, it worked well, actually. To, to the drivers in the simulation. But it's still related to research more than something that you can, can use, let's say, in the next year. But we will go there when we have smell. Vision, we are not going to speak about vision more than probably this slide. Um, as I said before, vision is the main source of information for us about the world in general, not only for interactive system, not only for computer system. Mm. Uh, and the vision is enabled by the pair's high plus brain, in s putting things simply. Mm. Uh, so how the high work, uh, I, I'm going to read that basically. So we see light reflected from objects in the world or on the screen and their image is focused upside down on the back of our eye. Then the receptor in the eye transform it in electrical signal which are passed to the brain that detect patterns, if they are, recognize things if there are known things and movements and we know that I'm looking to this kind of battle because it looks like a battle, as many other battles, and it's white. Because the light reflected give me the information that is white. This is very a level, then there is different kind of receptor, receptor for luminosity, receptor for colors, etc. But this is very uh, high level. And we are, again, skipping most of the vision because we already know how to build graphical interface because we know what we can see, more or less, mm, in a traditional, uh, in a typical vision environment. Mm. But we can speak about eyes uh, because for, for the gaze, not, so, not for the sensory part, but for the mode of interaction part. Mm. So the question that is made there is, can we control a computer or a smartphone or whatever solely, uniquely, only using the eyes? And the answer is yes, actually, uh, with interfaces that leverage on eye tracking or a gazed, mm, they are basically synonyms. Mm. So a person gaze, what a look on the screen, where I fix my uh, sight can be used 
to control, to s not only to see where I'm, what, where I'm fixing my, my sites, what I'm looking for, but also to control elements on the screen. Mm -hmm. So using the eye both as a receptor of information and provider in a way of information. And this could be done typically, this is done typically with dedicated hardware components that are eye trackers mm, that are in the next slide. Mm. And this could be done clearly alone or in combination with other inputs modalities if you want multimodality like mouse, keyboards, touch screen, etc. So main application areas, this is things that is actually used and work now, uh, main application areas are two. The first one is to, uh, for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Again, some people cannot move maybe the rest of the body, but they have full control of their eyes movement. And so that is the only, only mode of interaction for them to interact with any piece of technology. And so by looking at things, they can actually use an interface. They can type, they can press buttons, they can do other things with the interface. Mm -hmm. In substitution to mouse and keyboard because they cannot use that, use that. Mm -hmm. So that is one way, mm -hmm. one application area. So to find a more efficient and novel way to facilitate this kind of interaction in a non-multimodal. Then, clearly, if the application also support mouse, keyboard, et cetera, could be a multimodal, enabling more people to use it. And the other one is to use data mm, to understand human behavior. Mm, and also, as a result, to explore novel user interface. For data, I mean that if I look at, at the website, mm, and we all, look at the same website with an eye tracker. The eye tracker knows where you were looking at in that website. Mm? And if we give a task to all of us to, I don't know, buy a ticket on that website, we have 30, let's say, different traces, patterns of eye trackers for when, where I look in the website. So I can discover if my website has a lot of useless stuff that nobody look at or not. Or if the user before finding the button, buy ticket, look around a lot in circle and then say, oh yes, it's these. Or click in a lot of places before seeing the, the right place. And, and you have data, so you know how much time the user is spending what is looking at specifically mm, before reaching that button that is the end of the task, let's say. Mm. So this is useful to understand, to improve, let's say, website, but also to understand humans. Mm. There are, so these are three examples of a trackers. Um, what, what are trackers? And then I will go back to the other, uh, to the deprecation area. A trackers are a piece of hardware with or without a screen, and this bar here, also these, and also these, or, or the one on the top, and also these things here in these glasses, is a series of infrared cameras that try to localize the pupil in your eyes and track the movement of the pupils in your eyes so that you Th that those things know where you are looking at precisely because they track the pupils, so all the movement of the pupils. And they also know how much you fix a certain point through this tracking. Mm -hmm. And so this is a series of cameras, also typically infrared cameras, that track specifically your eyes, your eyes movement, your eyes fixation. Mm -hmm. and if you put it with a screen, you can see where the user is looking at specifically in the screen, the movements in the screen. Maybe first, maybe when you have looked at this, first you have looked here, stayed, stayed a little bit here, and then moved here, and then here, 
and then on the title, and then maybe on the link, and then maybe here. So all the path of movements. Hmm? In these slides, in a website, in an application, whatever. If you have a screen, hmm? there is also a version of these without the screen, just the set of cameras that you can put on any computers and use it an external device. Or with gla glasses. Why putting any tracker on glasses? What can be useful for? To make it general purpose, it's say, the motivation from the producer, uh, from the application perspective. Yeah, the glasses are not only for clear looking at a screen, because otherwise you just need that. You don't need to, to have glasses. Why do you want to put eye, eye tracker while walking around? They sell it, so there is a, a reason. Okay, it could be, it could be, but not for that reason, yeah. It could be for mixed reality application, also virtual reality actually could be useful, uh, but not, not, not typically, that would be embedded in the virtual reality headset, not in glasses like this probably. These are just normal glasses, this one, n nothing specific, just the tracker, like my glasses with the track, not my, because clearly these are not for, for seeing better, but just normal glasses with and a tracker put here. Uh, less sophisticated than the Google Glasses. Here. Understand human behavior. Where do you look at in a supermarket? Which products do you look at? in a place, where do you look at? Hmm? How much time do you look at a certain advertisement on the wall? To, to understand human behavior also in outside computers, hmm? in, in the world. Hmm? So they, they use, for instance, in supermarkets to have more targeted marketing campaign so that, okay, if they put together these things, they, this is one thing that everybody look at, they will put together another things that nobody look at, but they want to sell it, so we'll put it together. Mm -hmm. So strategies like this. I don't know if this is a strategy, but just to, to make an example. Mm -hmm. So these are more for, let's say, the, the real world, mm -hmm. outside the computer. Mm -hmm. Understanding behavior in the world of people. Uh, now here there is a, a very brief description how it works at the tracker. Uh, you, you can, if you have enough money, buy a tracker. Hmm? You, there are producer. The, this one is one of the, the main producer of a tracker, hmm? Toby, and it does all the three uh, of a tracker in the slide before, and also others without the screen. So how a tracker works with a computer, for for instance. So basically, a tracker is again infrared cameras plus some projectors for lights for illumination, not mm, white light, but for illuminating the the face of the person, and some algorithms to understand the, the raw data and communicate that in, in some way. So the projector creates patterns hmm, uh, of near-infrared light on the eyes, and then the camera hmm, takes high-resolution images of the eyes and the patterns very, very frequently. And then you can use algorithms, machine learning, image processing, mathematical algorithms, et cetera, to determine the eye's position and gaze point. The gaze point is the point where the user is looking at. So my eye's position is one thing, and where I'm looking at is one other thing. Maybe I have glasses, normal glasses, and so my, there is a correction to be done because there is a lenses that reflect the light different. Mm. And, and this is embedded in the, in the eye tracker. Mm. So all, all these three things here. And there is, again, one that is just this piece here, and you can put it on your computer. It's very small. Not cheap, but very small. Um, 
Hmm? So in the end, it gives you this information, where the loser was looking at, how much time, and we, so the patterns on the screen, if we speak about the screen, and how much time it look at the screen. And by default, uh, for getting information, for acquiring data, oh, yes. So this is one, one application area, hmm? understanding behavior. This is, for instance, something for uh, people with disabilities. So this is a version of an eye tracker that's made for people with disabilities. And this is, um, it's not it's sort of a keyboard. Uh, so instead of having letters, you have categories. Hmm? So if you are a nonverbal person, you can use that, look at those things to say, I want to go out, I, I have, I'm hungry, etc. Without using letters, without typing on the screen, you can also have uh, keyboards on screen, but also this pictorial based uh, communication. Hmm? Um, so what you see hmm, as a result of this understanding behavior is something like this. Hmm? It, both are sort of a heat map uh, th this one is an heat map. The first one is a heat map, and this is, is a scan path analysis. Mm -hmm. They represent more or less the same information. Where the user is looking at, and for how much time he's looking at that point. So here we see that the user, or multiple users, mm, maybe these are data combined for multiple people, have looked a lot here in these red areas, and a lot here in this logo. And then a fairly good amount here and here, but clearly nobody looked here or here. These two labels are, for this task, in this specific context, are useless. If they weren't there, nobody will have noticed because nobody even have passed through with their eyes, with their sights. And so here you see how much time, what you are looking at and how much time you stay on a specific place. And here you have more or less the same information. So the bigger circle is how much time you stay in, a, in that place. If the circle is big, you uh, look at the place a lot of time, for, for a lot of time. And the arrows, the lines are the path. Hmm? So you look, for instance, here, then moved here, then moved here, then moved here, then go back here. The movement, not only the areas that you look at, but which was the first, which was the second, which was the third elements that I look at. And I, I will say this next time. Uh, we will speak a little more about this next time because it's something that Professor Corno uh, left behind uh, the part about how people read on the web, uh, and it was about a tracking and heat map, so we will briefly have a, a break to, 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 re to come back to the visual design slides uh, to just focus a little bit of this uh, next time, because now there is clear no time. And this is instead of an example, this is something that is in Windows. If you have a Windows computer and you plug in an eye tracker, these options appear. Hmm? This is not for getting data, like heat map, scan path, but it's for interacting with your eyes, uh, for which there is this activation method. Uh, why do you need an activation method? If I have an application with three buttons, one button, one big button in the middle, and some white space, and I have to press that button with my eyes, why I need an activation method? To prevent clicks. Because the problem with eyes is that, yeah, it's right, the problem with eyes is that you look at everything. You have text that you want to read, and you maybe stay on that text for a while. And then you have a button, but you don't want to read a button. Maybe you want to press a button. And then there is another button that you don't want to press because it's the wrong one. And the problem with the eye tracking is that you look at this, all the things in the same way. There's no way to distinguish if you are just moving on or if you want to press something. 
It's, like, it's not like the mouse that I can move the mouse and then when I want to print, the, to press, I click and the action is done. With vision, you just look at things. And so there is this problem that's called the Mida touch. Do you, you know the story of the King Mida that everything that touches becomes gold? This is more or less the same pr problem. Everything that you look at could be clickable, but you don't want to click everything. So you need to have some activation methods some strategies to say, okay, I am looking around because I'm reading. I'm understanding where to go next. And then at a certain point, I will do something particularly to press a button, to select something. And this particular, for instance, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Windows, there are two main options that are the two traditional main options. One is what they call dwell and the other one is the switch. So the switch, the idea of the switch is that given that we don't know what we want to press, we want, want to, to read, let's say, when I want to press something, I have to look at the things and press a button with something. Press a switch. Hmm? So if I look at a specific point, like a button, and press the switch, then the action is completed, is done. Then, this, this is an option, but requires that you can press a switch, a button, a key, a key on the keyboard, something like that. The other option is uh, dwell. So basically, the idea of dwell is that uh, let's add a time. So if you look at the screen, it's not a problem. But you fix something for five seconds, for three seconds, for time that the user decides actually in this application. So let's look at the button for five seconds. Then that button have an animation maybe on it that completes like a progress bar. And then when the progress bar is complete, five seconds are elapsed and that button is pressed. This is slower than the switch option, but you can do everything with your eyes. So in this, model, in this model, you look at the button, fix your eyes on that button for, let's say, five seconds, an animation start. When the five seconds are completed, that button is pressed. If you change your mind or you are just reading, you just move away from that button and no action is performed within the five seconds time that you have before completing the option, the operation. Again, and this is in Windows 10, probably also in Windows 11, will be, it's the eye control setting that is automatically present when you attach a net tracker. Any question? Okay, so we can continue speaking about this on Thursday. Uh, on Thursday, I will just remind you two things. First, on Wednesday, there is the deadline for submitting milestone number two. And on Thursday, you start and maybe also finish, probably, or almost finish, the work for the milestone number three that will be, this is already online, that will be creating two pages, just two pages, in a wireframe mode of your prototype. One being the main page of your application and the other one being the, a significant page, according to you, from your application, stemming from the results of the paper prototype. And then you can start creating the code-based prototype, so the, interactive, the final interactive prototype after that lab. As a reminder, wireframe are still black and white, so don't add colors to wireframe. And we have done for today. Thank you. <laughs>